Olaf approached the cross bench and took a seat beside her. Thorgood greeted him and asked who he was. Olaf told her his own name and his father's and added, You must think it bold of a slave girl's son to dare to sit down beside you and strike up a conversation with you. Thorgood replied, You must think you've done more dangerous things in your life than talk to women. Hello and welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And this time around, we are reading the Lockstyle Saga, one of the Icelandic sagas. Yeah, I'm, I had a really strange experience reading this. I can't wait to talk about this together. I had never read any sagas before, so this is quite something. Now, you you obviously work on medieval stuff all the time. Mm-hmm. I know you've worked on Old English stuff, which is a related language to the Old Norse that these were written in. Well, I, ha- I haven't really worked on Old English. Like, I studied Old English, and so I have a familiarity with the language, and so I've helped students with it, but I've never actually done research on it. And so while I've kind of helped others in working on Old Norse stuff, I haven't been in that space for in research purposes. So this has been a really weird experience. And that was years ago, too. So this has been very weird. Oh, that's interesting. When I was finishing up my undergrad, I took a class that was all about the sagas. And so I read a bunch of them. And it was really an interesting class. Uh, although the professor was terrible. <laughs> she was she was very much of the, in class, we are going to just summarize what happens in the plot. Mm, and we are going yeah. to add nothing to it. Mm. And it was very slow. I could actually read along to the text at the rate that she was explaining the plot in class. No, oh, no. So I stopped going. And it was fine. I don't know. But uh, nevertheless, I really enjoyed the sagas once I got used to their weird quirks. And I'm super excited to get back to them and to start inflicting them on other people like did, yourself. Did you read quite a few of them? Because I get the sense they're kind of one universe. Yeah, we've got a link in the show notes to a particular edition of a collection of the sagas of the Icelanders. And it's like 800 pages long. And it's got a few very long full-length sagas, including this one, uh, about 150 pages each. And then it's got some shorter ones as well. And I feel like we read two-thirds of this book. For the Mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a reasonable sampling of some of the longer and some of the shorter sagas. So should I say a little bit uh, in the way of background before we get into the text? Yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Icelandic sagas? Sure. Um, The Laxdala saga is uh, the saga of the people of a particular region in the northwest of Iceland. And uh, saga is a thing, literally a thing that is said, um, which is a little bit like in English, the word tale, like the thing you tell. But a saga, unlike a tale, is extended. It's capacious. It's almost encyclopedic. Um, unlike the short form of uh, what's called the thutter, which is a sort of a, a short tale that's part of the saga universe, right? And so this story cycle, or I, I keep calling it like a universe or an encyclopedia, because it's got this quality of being having tons and tons of information in it, and it shows up in different kinds of literary forms in each of the different sagas. Characters will show up from other sagas, so they almost kind of touch at the edges. And for me, this felt like a really different form of narrative. The only thing that we'd read together that it kind of reminded me of was the Mahabharata, where um, there it was gods and not human beings, but it was that same sense of complex genealogies and characters coming in and going away. Um, so that was really neat. So sagas survive from Scandinavia in general, but the biggest group of them is in Old Icelandic. And they were mostly written down in the 1200s, around 1300 or so, but the events they describe come from as early as the 9th century, so right in the period when Iceland was first being settled, and that's something we might talk about together a little bit. There are a few different kinds of sagas. Sagas about kings, sagas about ancient legends or myths, adaptations of stories of knights, so like King Arthur, Charlemagne, stuff like that, Um, and also sagas about early Christian Iceland, especially stories of saints and bishops. The Laxdaila saga, though, is what's often called um, one of these sagas of Icelanders, that is stories about actual people, their genealogies, their feuds, their farms, and their land. And this particular work is written down in the uh, 13th century, as I mentioned, but it's describing events that start as early as about the late 800s or 900s, so when people are just first getting to Iceland. And these opening chapters are incredibly detailed. Um, in, they're dizzying. I, like, I could not keep them straight. But once you get a little ways in, around chapter 32, you get the story of Guthrun, and she's basically at the center of events, one way or the other, right through to the very end. And so she's a kind of a kind of a, a counterweight almost, or a kind of center of gravity for that whole latter part of the of the saga. Yeah, uh, the primary story that we get in Lockstella Saga is the story of a love triangle. And I'm about to say characters' names, and we should point out that neither of us know Icelandic, study Old Norse. Like we're going to pronounce things 
wrong, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. We're reading. It's fine. Uh, you know, no disrespect. So it's a sort of a love triangle at the very heart of this. And we've got Kjartan and Botley, who are not quite brothers, but Kjartan's father fostered Botley as a child. And so they grew up together and they're good friends. They're very close. They're as if brothers. And they're both promising young men. Mm. But Kjartan definitely has the edge, right? Kjartan is the prize of this part of Iceland. And Kjartan is very fond of Guthrun, who you mentioned, and we'll talk about her more later. But before he's going to settle down and marry her, he wants to see a bit of the world. He wants to have a bit of an adventure. So Kjartan and Botli wander off. They have some adventures. They make nice with the king of Norway. Botli ends up coming back to Iceland first. And while Guthrun wants to wait for Kjartan, Botli's like, I would like to marry you. Hmm. And her family and her community pressure her into accepting Botli's hand. And, well, this sets up some tremendous bad blood between, on the one side, Kjartan and his family, once Kjartan gets back, and, on the other side, Guthrun, Botli, and their families. And many, many lives are going to be traded back and forth until both sides are finally satisfied and peace can return to the region. Now, that's the core thing, but we get quite a lot of how did this situation, how did this devastating series of events that caused the deaths of so many people for honor, but really, did this have to happen? How did this all come to pass? And so we start many, many generations prior. In fact, we start at the very beginning with Ketel Flatnose, who is the ancestor of Kjartan, who decides to leave Norway in the first place because the king at the time is being a real jerk to him. He doesn't want to go to Iceland, which he calls that fishing camp. <laughs> and so they go to Scotland for a while. Things happen. He dies there, but his daughter Un is the one who goes to Iceland, settles there. And then you get a few more generations. Uh, you get Huskold, who has a whole story. You get his son, Olaf Peacock, who is quite fun uh, and who is the father of Kjartan. So we get several generations that lead up to it, and, and they have various interactions along the way. And this is one of the reasons why, as you say, it gets very confusing in the early chapters. Yeah, because you're not sure what you have to hang on to and what you can let go. And it was really only once I started letting go that I was able to kind of enjoy the ride, uh, which was neat. Exactly. Yeah, you get kind of invested in some of these characters. I quite like Un, but she's not around for very long. No. And she dies like everybody in a saga dies. Kind of either either you die very dramatically, like some of our main characters, or you just kind of die at the end of a chapter. And yeah, and we, you don't hear about that person again. They're just done. Yeah, it's just it's over. They died a few years later. Next chapter, someone else. Yeah, and sometimes it's kind of hard to tell how it's going to play out. So, for example, Melkorka, who turns out to be the daughter of the King of Ireland, but she's um, she's bought in a slave camp by Huskold, right? Um, and she's apparently mute and so on. And so we get that really interesting story about her and her child Olaf and so on. And and then it's almost like she doesn't. She kind of she kind of disappears. Like she's still around. She appears a little bit, but that lineage that she's brought to Iceland, this um, this Irish lineage, ends up being really kind of important and flavoring Kjartan's um, development in certain kinds of ways. So it's that the tracing out those strands in the tapestry is really interesting. Exactly. You're both given some further explanation for why the children, why the later generations are like they are, but you're also given a sense of where everything comes from and all these interesting places that you might get connected to. Because after all, these, like so many of the sagas, are based on real people, nominally based on real people anyways. And I don't see any real reason to doubt that there's some grain of truth into who these people are. But when these stories are being told for the next couple hundred years before they're finally codified and written down, it is about the families of people who are living in Iceland, right? It's about so-and-so whose great-great-great-great-great-grandmother was Guthrun, and therefore means that you are connected to, in some way to the King of Ireland many, many, many hundred years ago. Yeah. No, it's weird because you're absolutely right that, you know, there's no reason not to understand these as real people and they, they have individual qualities that we experience in all kinds of ways. But there's also a sense in which, and I think we get this most of all with Guthrun's story, where it's also got a kind of formal quality to it, you know, where it's almost, I don't want to say mythic, but like it's doing something formal beyond just telling about people's lives. 
So like we get um, a sense, almost a synoptic sense of how her life is going to be almost when we first meet her. And, and I find her like really interesting as a character, incredibly annoying and yet really interesting. <laughs> so, so she's said to be the most beautiful woman ever to have grown up in Iceland and no less clever than she was good looking. She was the shrewdest of women, highly articulate and generous as well. So she's incredibly beautiful, but also obviously really smart and shrewd, right? So smart in a particular kind of way. And one of the first things we hear about her is at, when she's very young, she's got to be like a teenager, like very young. She tells a dream she's had to um, a wise person, a wise man who, who could foretell uh, many events of the future. And um, the, the sequence of four dreams that she has, he explains as meaning that she'll have four husbands. And, and he sort of sketches out what, what the arc of those stories might be. And so then when we're following her story, we kind of, on the one hand, we have no idea what's going to happen. We don't know in the short term what's going to happen to these people, but we know what the big picture is, right? And and also he said something else really suggestive. He has said that we should talk about one of the husbands that, you know, I, I have the sense that the world will be Christianized you know, that Christianity will come. And that is one of the big things that's happening almost kind of in the background in her story. So so her story serves a really weird big picture function as well as a kind of a local personal function. We get the story of the marriages, the children, the bloodshed, but also the Christianization of Iceland um, and the relationship of its people to people in all these other lands. Like you said, Ireland, England, Norway, Denmark, and even Constantinople. So yes. it's like situating the local in the in the global kind of. It's really weird. It is really weird, but this is also something about the Vikings, right? Like the Vikings in real life actually did travel to all those lands, settled in many of those lands, and quite a number of them traded in Constantinople. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like it, people sometimes talk about Viking as not so much an identity as like a thing one did, one went Viking. Like it's almost like a, a profession or a vocation, you know? <laughs> yeah, and which is sort of how it comes off here. I mean, when, you know, you have to leave Iceland for a bit and go travel around and, you know, trade and do a few other things. There's there's not like stereotypical pillaging going on in any of that, but there's a lot of trade. But they do come back with stuff. Yeah, they come back, <laughs> they give out stuff and they come back home with stuff. Absolutely. Let's see, there's a lot of things we could talk about. Let's talk first about this notion that you were intrigued by, these prophetic dreams, because there's a lot of interesting prophecies and other things that we might now consider supernatural that happen. There are a few ghosts that haunt uh, a few farms and a few other things, you know, wronged people whose spirits come back to wreak havoc amongst other people. There are other prophetic dreams that happen at other points in it. And one of the interesting things, which you may not realize if this is your first time reading a saga, is that these all come true. Like all the ghosts are real and all the prophetic dreams actually come true. Yeah, there's this, um, I don't know if supernatural is the right word for it, but there's this whole sense that there's this whole, I guess it's religious system, like there's this whole way that things are that's kind of just below the surface. Even though we're also getting the story of the Christianization of Iceland, there's this whole other way of being. Like there's this one example of Hrapp, who's um, a person who lives in this farm and he dies and he leaves instructions that he should be buried under the door jam in the doorway, mm, right? Yes. And, and, and you read this and you're like, wow, that's weird. And then several pages <laughs> later, um, somebody, I don't know, it's a shepherd or some guy working there is like, I, I can't keep going in there because Hrapp keeps trying to grab me and kill me. And they're like, oh, okay. So they dig up the doorway, they dig out his body, they burn the body and take the ashes out to sea, and then, you know, everything is fine. <laughs> I mean, right, a couple right. Sort of, and it's like, this is like a totally matter-of-fact thing. I was like, oh, this happened, you know, got to fix it. Yeah, and it's actually like a weird sign of proficiency. Proficiency, is that the word I'm looking for? I want to, I don't necessarily want to say masculinity, hmm. but it's like a kind of adulting. Can you handle it? When a ghost shows up, do you know what to do? The good characters, the characters who are, so to speak, good at their jobs, good at being a good farmer, good at being a good neighbor, know how to handle this. And it's one of the ways that they prove themselves is by handling these upset spirits. It's a, it's a world of knowledge that Christianity, the onset of Christianity, and several hundred years later, like the writing down of these tales, doesn't seem to have affected, right? There's no sense of like, well, these gods and these stories and, and, and this sort of happening is from the pre-Christian era mm -hmm. and is a bit dodgy. And now we're all Christian and enlightened. Mm. There's a sense in which Christianity comes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it changes things. But that other stuff is not gone. But that other stuff, it's, it's all kind of part of a continuum. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I felt like the end of the saga was like so revealing and so interesting in that way. Because like, so you know, we were saying earlier that when we first see Guthrun, you know, we get the sense that 
the arrival of Christianity is something that's important to her story. So the the person who's interpreting her dream says, if my guess is right, there'll be a change in religion around that time, like when she's married to this one of the husbands. And then at the end of her story, so at the end of the saga, we hear how she became very religious. Um, she was the first Icelandic woman to learn the Psalter and spent long periods in the church praying at night. So she becomes like a, a devout woman, like almost like a nun, right? And she has her granddaughter, Herdis, who, who is with her. And Herdis has this dream. And I found this passage so cool. All right, so Herodis dreamed that a woman approached her. She wore a woven cape and a folded headdress, and her expression was far from kindly. She said to Herodis, tell your grandmother that I care little for her company, and that she'd prefer Herodis' company instead. So Herodis in the morning tells her dream, and then the following morning, her grandmother had the floorboards in the church removed at the spot where she was accustomed to kneel in prayer and the ground below dug up. There they found bones, which were blackened and horrible, along with a chest pendant and a large magician's staff. People then decided that a prophetess must have been buried there. The bones were moved to a remote place, little frequented by men. And I thought, wow, that's so interesting, right? <laughs> because, I mean, again, it's like with Hrop in the doorway, right? Like there's this presence that's still there has to be dealt with, right? But unlike Hrop, uh, who gets, you know, body is burned and his ashes are thrown away out at sea, this body just gets moved to a remote place, little frequented by men, right? So it's not gone from the landscape, but it's moved. Yeah, it's put in a more appropriate place. Where it won't bother people anymore. Well, you know, a safer place. No, I mean, I guess the reason I thought it was so interesting is like when you think about churches as symbolic spaces that exert a kind of force on the communities there within, right? Moving these blackened and horrible bones, not getting rid of them, right? Not destroying them, putting them over here, yeah. right? Where you have to kind of seek them out, right? You're not going to stumble over them. I thought that was a really interesting way of kind of communicating this world that um, is gone, but not totally gone. Yeah, exactly. And the way that that world is gone, but not totally gone, permeates through many different layers. Like, in a sense, that is what these sagas are, right? A way of bringing the past into the present. That is why you tell these stories. That's why eventually they get written down. And that's why I think they become so formalized. I mean, this is just me thinking here, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you give it the structure of the dream and then the four stories and then Guthrie having the four marriages that are revealed in that, and it make it more of a narrative, more of a story, then it becomes more memorable. It becomes an easier thing to pass along in a sense, because it's got that shape. Absolutely. And so that's part of the strategy of how you're going to bring the past into the present. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. That's what I meant by saying it was almost uh, the formal qualities. It's almost like, I don't know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears or something like that. You know, there's going to be one, there's going to be two, there's going to be three. Here it's four marriages, but you, you know the shape of the story as you go in. Exactly. The other interesting way that we see this process unfolding is with the constant naming of the land. That's so neat. It, it's super neat. And it's one of the interesting things because Iceland is one of those rare places where people settled and there was no one there beforehand, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to like Greenland, right? Yeah. Greenland, when they get to Greenland, and there's a whole saga, a very short one, but a, a saga about going to Greenland. It's kind of interesting. Not as good as this. But anyway, there are people in Greenland. And so, you know, you're colonizing and like the interaction between the people who lived there before and the people who live there now is a thing. In Iceland, there are no such people. It was just trees and animals and all that sort of stuff. And so everything needs to get a name. And because these sagas are about events that took place when people were first landing there, anything that happens is liable to cause a name to emerge that might still be there today. And and also, it's almost like the landscape gets kind of scarred by the violence that takes place in it. Like naming sometimes happens in a kind of, you know, less... I don't know, less horrifying kind of way, like a place is named after a person or whatever. But it's often named after acts of violence. Like there's um, one situation where Hurt is said to return home with substantial wounds. This site has been called Orastudal, Battle Valley, ever since. Right. And then there's some other a uh, number of examples that have to do with shorelines, which I thought were also really captivating. There's one beautiful example. Um, Thord and all his companions were drowned, and the ship smashed into small pieces, the keel washing ashore on an island, which has since been called Kjarli, Keel Island. Thord's shield drifted ashore on an island called Skaldre, Shield Island. His body and the bodies of his companions drifted ashore directly afterwards and are buried in a mount at Hogsness, uh, Mount Point. So, like, it's almost like, I don't know, the fragmentation of the community gets absorbed almost into the landscape and in particular into the shoreline. And there's a couple other examples like that as well. So it's a fascinating moment in part because 
on the one hand, Thord and all his companions were drowned and the ship smashed into small pieces that killed. Like, that's it. There's right. no scenes of sadness. There's no extended bit about how terrible this was. There's just, I mean, there's a description of what led up to it, but there's just Thord and all his companions were drowned. It's told very plainly and matter-of-factly. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's included in the story, but it's not given that space that we would now kind of expect for a sad event in a novel, let's say, to have. But it's also memorialized in the names on the land. They named exactly. three different places after this accident. Exactly. So it's clearly important. Yeah, I think you really put your finger on it. Like, we have memorialization happening, but without the kind of affect that we're accustomed to accompanying it. Exactly. Right? It's just, it's very plain. Yeah, it's, which is one of the things that I find fascinating about the sagas in general, is that the affect is very plain, the affect is very quiet, but it's still there. It's just poking out in very different ways, and I'm always intrigued by that. And I, I'll admit, it took me reading a few of them to get into the rhythm of it. <laughs> so if you read your first one and you're like, this is nothing, nothing is happening, it's just a bunch of names, <laughs> I understand. But like, trust me, it gets, it gets, you get, you get into it once you, once you learn how to read it, I guess. Yeah. You see that same, like, I don't want to say absence of affect, but that same quietness in the scenes of violence, of which there are a lot, mm, right? Yes. I mean, even though people are clearly moved by incredible passion and, you know, anger and all these, all these things, right? It's it's generally like not quite visible, right? People do these acts, but you don't see a lot of that kind of the emotions that are driving it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, you, know, you find out because there's the blood. You find out because <laughs> yeah. people die. Yeah, and you find out by the, the the intensity that someone like like Guthrie will demand of her children to avenge their murdered father. Let's say. But it's even that's just like one or two sentences, but they're very cutting sentences, let's say. Yeah. And and like after the passage of time has happened, right? So they're like, it's not in the heat of passion, right? It's more like there's an obligation on you. But also, I think even that is like, it's 13 years later. Yeah. You yeah. kids are old enough now to take care of this. Why haven't you yet? Exactly. Okay, boys, you're big enough now to take revenge, right? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. that kind of seething emotion that sits under the surface and just percolates forever until it bursts into violence. That's yeah. how I feel like a lot of the emotion in this plays out. Well, yeah. And you see that actually beautifully captured in the way in which Guthrie does not, seemingly does not react after the death of uh, her husband, Bodley. Uh, the, the men come out of the house after they've killed her husband and they tell her what happened. Uh, Guthrie is wearing a long tunic, a close-fitting woven bodice and a mantle on her head. She had bound a shawl about her that was decorated in black stitching with fringes at the ends. Helgi Hardbeinson walked over to Gudrun and used the end of her shawl to dry the blood off the spear with which he had pierced Bodley. Guthrun looked at him and merely smiled. Haldor said to him, that was a vile thing to do and merciless of you. Helgi told him to spare his sympathy, as something tells me that my own death lies under the end of that shawl. And it's such a great moment, right? Because, like, she doesn't get upset. She's not weeping. She's not yelling. She's not, she smiles at them. And you have to assume this is like, you know, revenge is going to happen. Yeah. Right. But she doesn't need to express any of the emotion that goes along with that. Um, because, like you said, 12 years later, she's going to send her sons to deal with it. Well, also, she knew this was going to happen. Right. Yeah, that's true. Botley is killed in revenge for Kjartan's death by Botley and his men, which Guthrun incited, encouraged him on to. Botley didn't really want to do it, but Guthrun was like, you have to, for our honor. And, you know, she knew what was going to happen. I mean, she also knew that she was going to have a fourth husband because of her vision when she was young. But nevertheless, like, this is a day that was coming. And part of her responsibility is to take this in stride. It's to do that kind of, like, high-level I, Claudius kind of politicking, I guess. Yeah, sort of. I mean, it's just, I, I, you know, you were talking earlier about the quietness of the emotion, right? That you, that you do things, not because you're compelled exactly, but, but because those are the things that you do. That is what one does. Like there's a, there's a lot of examples of violence here, but one of the ones that I found really kind of a little bit shocking was this um, moment when Thorid takes revenge on her ex-husband, Germund. Um, uh, they split up and so he's left her and he's leaving by ship, but he has not provided her with appropriate compensation. Like he should make sure he, there's a certain amount he should be paying to her as compensation, you know, when he's leaving her and their baby daughter. So she gets somebody to row her out to his ship and she sneaks on there at night. She takes his sword, which is very, very precious to him, and she leaves their baby daughter there. And then she goes back into the small boat and they have, they sort of yell at each other a little bit and um, she, she leaves. And his boat ends up being um, caught in a storm, destroyed, and they're all drowned. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> like, 
including the baby. And and the the saga writer is all like, and you know, it's, it's very plain, you know, there's no like emotion about it. And I'm like, wait, (laughs) what, 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 what? (laughs) you know, and just after that, and the aftermath of not that shipwreck, but another shipwreck, there are quite a number of them, we get an elaborate account of the inheritance pattern that follows depending on the order in which the people on the boat drowned. Mm. And so, you know, the one person who survived is kind of, you know, explaining, you know, the order in which everybody else drowned, and that dictates what happens legally. And it's like, I don't want to say cold-blooded, it's just like it's a different way of thinking. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's 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 interesting both in terms of like thinking of it in the moment and then also thinking of it in the story, right? Mm, mm. This moment where you're like, well, we need to attend to proper procedure now. We need to like have this moment of like, okay, here's what happens. Like sort of like, you know, someone died and it's like, okay, well, we need to like, who do we call? to deal with the body, to like do the death certificate? Do we need a death certificate? Do we need, do we need to like have paperwork? It's a kind of bureaucratization of it in a sense, but that's part of it. But then also like, what is the emotional payoff when you're doing that? Well, it's, it's deferred or it's, it's left unspoken because in a sense, you, the reader know what the emotion here is. So you don't need to be told it. Sort of, but maybe part of it too is that it's not so much about individual. I mean, we hear about individuals, but it's not so much about the individual kind of negotiating their life course, but the kinship network. Like you're always embedded in a kinship network. Well, exactly. That's also true. And that determines a lot of, not it doesn't determine what you do, but it determines what your options are. Yeah. Right. And what your obligations are. Exactly. Uh, this is the problem that Guthrie found herself in when Botley was pressing for marriage upon her, was that everyone else in the community and her family was like, no, you really should do this. Botley's a good catch and it's it's fine. Uh, and she was like, well, if everybody says that, you know, Guthrie, who does not accept what she doesn't want in any other circumstance, agrees to marry Botley. Yeah. That is kind of like also like women get pressured into doing stuff. I mean, that's, oh, absolutely. That's like, but, but you also see it with like the even very powerful men's actions being constrained. So, for example, Olaf Peacock, right? <laughs> you know, when um, the aftermath of the whole situation with Botley and Kirtan is, is being sort of worked out after Kirtan's death, there's this whole set of competing desires for revenge. and But everybody looks to Olaf because he's the one who's going to decide what the different compensations are going to be. Like, in other words, who might have to be exiled? Who might have to pay a price? Who can stay? Who has to go? Right? And he is going to, you know, so everybody has to defer to him because of his kinship relationship to the victim. And then on top of that, he has a certain kind of obligations that he feels toward Butley because even though he's not his son, he raised him in his own household. And so it's not just his, you know, the fact that Butley is his nephew, but it's also that he was raised in his household and that creates an additional set of obligations, right? So it's like, it's not like your choices are made for you exactly, but like your decision tree is dramatically pruned by your your place in the kinship network. And it's also pruned because because it's such a small community. Mm, And mm. so Olaf and a few other people, Snorri the Gothi, who's like a powerful person in the region later in the book, they want things to settle down. They want the violence to stop. This is not a violence loving community. This is a community that turns to violence when it's felt necessary and it accepts that part of it, but they don't want this to keep going. Like there's a sense in which, you know, you have a, a real Hatfields and McCoy situation where they're just going to fight each other for generations and generations and nothing will cause it to stop because each death will have to be paid by another one. Mm-hmm. How do we stop that? And in a sense, that's actually what this story is about, right? It's about this community who find themselves in this terrible bind. How did this bind come to happen? How did this feud between two families come to pass? And then what did people try to do to mitigate that? And how did that work? And what eventually calmed everything down? Yeah. And it's interesting that even though we're also getting the kind of concurrent story of the Christianization of Iceland, that seems to have absolutely nothing, from what I can tell, to do with resolving this problem. Oh, yeah. yeah, Nothing at all. I will say, like, (laughs) the Christianization of Iceland shows up in a lot of these stories, because a lot of them take place in this historical time frame. And so... You know, there's always that fun moment in some of the longer sagas where it's like, and now Christianity showed up. And it's like, well, what are we going to do with that? Well, and for a lot of them, it's like, it's just a thing that happened. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't play that sort of plot contrivance kind of role. Here it shows up as like both Kjartan, who is the first Icelander to celebrate Lent, I guess, and uh, what you were saying about Guthrun earlier. You know, they both are early people who do remarkable things, and it's part of their general remarkableness as outstanding Icelanders who we should remember and pay attention to. But in terms of like, you know, Christianity bringing in a new ethic? No, no that doesn't seem to happen at all. Nobody's thinking about that. No. 
No, I think that's exactly right. And there's also a real sense that, you know, Christianity is something that comes from somewhere else. And it's like basically those like kind of annoying and bossy Norwegians who made us do it, you know? Like, oh, yeah, 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 Right? It's not exactly forced on them because nobody's going to accept that. But it's the, the idea of it coming from outside is really clear. Right? Absolutely. And, you know, a certain amount of like, you know, soft diplomatic pressure bringing it in. <laughs> And one of the things I was really struck by here is that even though like it's focused on Iceland and there's this very rich description of the the physical landscape, the farms, the roughness of the landscape, the shorelines that we mentioned earlier, and people come and go and come and go all the time, we also get a sense of it situated in the world. Like we said a little bit about this before, um, situated relative to Ireland, to England, to Norway, to Denmark, so the, that region, right, Sweden, right, um, and, but also further afield, Constantinople, um, when both son Butley, you know, who's, who's, who's quite young at the time that his father gets avenged. Um, but then he grows up and he spends many years in Constantinople with the Varangian guard. Um, and he, when he comes back, even later on, he comes back wearing magnificent clothes of scarlet um, or silk brocade. He became known as Butley the Elegant. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Um, and he's got like this silk brocade suit given to him by the emperor of Byzantium, a cloak of red scarlet, a gilded hem- helmet, and a red shield with the figure of a knight drawn on it in gold. I mean, it's a little fantastical, but it's also a nice kind of connection back to Olaf the Peacock, you know, his forebearer, who also, you know, as, as this elegant, whose who's clothing is commented on. I just thought that was really enchanting. I mean, I'm not accustomed to, you know, uh, seeing this powerful warlike men are being distinguished to a large extent, in terms of their clothing. And and also clothing serves all kinds of weird functions in this narrative for the men and for the women, um, and not just in beautiful clothing, also like other kinds of clothing. I don't know if you noticed what happens with, I think it's Guthrun's first husband? Oh, yes, yes. So that was a particularly interesting moment. Wasn't it? So early on, you know, Guthrun marries this guy named Thorvald, who's very rich, but she's not super into him, even at the beginning. And eventually she meets a guy named Thord, I know. Icelandic sagas <laughs> only have seven names. She meets a guy named Thord, who she likes better. And so one day, Thord suggests to Guthrin that she make Thorvald, her husband, a womanly shirt. A really really low cut, right? A really that's right. It's a really <laughs> low cut shirt that shows off too much cleavage. And <laughs> that would be understood as womanly. And then that will be him cross-dressing, which is grounds for divorce. Isn't that wild? And that's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and then Thord's wife is accused of wearing manly clothes, and so they get a divorce then. And then uh, this it's really its really awful. Thord is no good. As Guthrun, as, as Guthrun puts it, if women go about dressed as men, they invite the same treatment as do men who wear shirts cut so low that the nipples of their breasts can be seen. Both are grounds for divorce. <laughs> Like, whoa, you guys. Yeah. Oh, God. And the, re- the, the reverse one of that, Guthrie asking Thord, whether the rumor is true that your wife Aud is often dressed in breeches with a codpiece and long leggings. Mm-hmm. He replied that he'd not noticed. You can't be paying her much attention in that case, said Guthrun, if you haven't noticed such a thing. Or what other reason is there then for calling her breeches Aud? Thord said, she can't have been called that for long. I mean, it's this ridiculous <laughs> sequence where like, they're contriving these plots for each other. They're, they're being manifestly evil. I mean, I don't know if they would have understood it as evil, but to our eyes, they're sort of, you know, preying off gender insecurities and anxieties. And they're doing it in this very obvious way, but they're being very coy about it. And it's 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 very funny. Secretly, these books are very funny. Yeah. No. And also, there's a neat little like uh, moment where um, you know this all happens. The divorces happen. Odd's brothers were not at all pleased, but nothing was done. And it's almost like that's a moment where you know the the catastrophe of violence could easily have broken out, right? Yeah. Because of her being dishonored and everything, but it doesn't happen. I mean, because my sense of it is that Odd's family is in no position to deal with the consequences of mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Getting your just revenge, even if it was justified and people understood it, would still cost you too much. Whereas when we look later at Guthrun and Kjartan and so forth, these are incredibly rich families. They can do this all day long and they'll still have money up the nose. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, that's remarkable. But the, it is also remarkable to see that sense of like questioning your masculinity or your femininity. You know, you're, you're, you're slightly subverting gender roles and you're doing it at your wife's request or your husband's, you know, connivance. And this is enough to get you called out and and divorced and 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 you know it, it's interesting how like it really underlines to me how the social expectations of gendered clothing is really just an excuse to harm people who 
break it, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. neither of these two people who got accused of cross-dressing even wanted to be cross-dressing. No, they're, tra they're sort of trapped into it, right? Yeah, it's fascinating to see that described in, in, in that kind of detail, in that specific step-by-step -step detail here. Yeah, and again, like thinking about Guthrun's character, you know, like, I mean, you admire her intelligence, I guess, and her ability to get what she wants, but she's also like so bad oh, she's in awful. so many different ways. She reminded me so much of, of Becky Sharp from Vanity <laughs> Fair, right? Like uh -huh, very different uh -huh. in many ways, but that sense of like, this is what I want. This is what I have to do to get it. This is how I get away with it and damn everything else. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. No, I think um, I think that's a really good comparison. <laughs> um, one of the other things I was really struck by in this um, narrative, I mentioned a little bit earlier the um, the figure of Melkorka, um, who's a slave when we first see her in, in abject conditions. And then it turns out that, you know, her father is the king of Ireland, right? And so it's easy to see that as just like, oh, a kind of like, I don't know what to call it, like a hidden princess story. In other words, there's somebody who's looks like they're really like downcast in the world and they turn out to be, um, you know, to have a different kind of status. But it's really not quite that kind of story at all. You know, when we first are introduced to her, it's actually after we've already heard about other instances of enslavement, like we hear about how very early on in the immigration to Iceland, there was someone called Askout who had um, immigrated along with Thord. So, so slaves are part of the early settlement period, right? So um, Thord's neighbor, Hoskell, goes to the Breno Islands, just off Sweden. So it's quite some distance away from Iceland, where he sees a man in costly clothing wearing a Russian hat who has a dozen female slaves for sale, kind of like crammed into a little cell. And, um, and this passage is just really, I don't know, it's, I found it really interesting in a whole bunch of different ways. Huskold slept with the woman that same evening. The next morning, as they were dressing, Huskold spoke. There's not much sign of pride in this clothing which the wealthy Gilly, that's the one who sold her, has provided you with. But I suppose it's more of a burden for him to dress twelve than for me to dress one. Huskold then opened a chest from which he took fine women's clothing and gave it to her. Everyone remarked on how well fine clothing suited her. It's like, you know, again, like she she's abject and then she gets clothing, right? But it's it's also all kind of horrible. I mean, she's kept in this like cage like cell like environment before that. She's mute, like she doesn't speak and he doesn't discover that she can speak until years later when they've had a she's had a child from him and um the child's a little he overhears her speaking to the child at one point, the child's about two. Um and he takes her home, but his wife doesn't like the fact that he's brought this slave home, this woman slave. And so he has to eventually kind of keep her in a separate household. And it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of awful. <laughs> I mean, we don't, like, in other words, it's, it's, it kind of hovers in that space between a fairy tale-ish happy story, right? Because their son, Olaf, is going to go to Ireland and she will have taught him to speak Irish, right? So when he goes there, she sends him with the language and she sends him with a gold arm ring that she has somehow managed to hold on to all this time. Um, so he's recognized by his grandfather and so on. But it's, it's still kind of tragic, right? Like, for example, when Olaf goes to Ireland, she's asked him to bring back her old nurse, and Olaf meets the woman, you know, uh, who must have raised her, right? Um, and wants to take her back, but the king, uh, her father says no. And, and so it's just, it's a strange story. You know, I, I guess I find it so strange because you think, oh, this is one of those kind of like fairy tale-ish, you know, secret princess stories. And then you're like, no, it's like more, I don't know, not real, that's the wrong word for it, but it's more abject than that or more trapped in the real world. It's no fairy tale. So it, I found that a really strange and absorbing story. I didn't entirely know what to make of it. I also don't know what to make of it. The other thing that I find particularly strange about it is the setup. Just Hoskold decides he wants a slave. It looks like an impulse purchase. It looks like an it impulse absolutely purchase. Does. like, oh, nice slave. And again, because you know this is a saga, it, you don't get a, any sort of psychological you don't get interiority in that sense. You don't say, no. he thought, I would like a slave because after all, blah, blah, blah. Like nobody explains themselves that way in these stories. So you don't know why he's doing it. And it doesn't necessarily seem like him as much as you know him at this point. So it's very strange. Well, he sleeps with her. Right? I mean, he's he's bought her for sex, right? Yeah. And they have sex once or twice and he, she has a kid and then he ignores her. <laughs> mm. Well, 
yeah, but she's still around. Like, you know, like she, she, she gets into a sort of a tussle with the, with his wife at one point. And so that's when he puts her in a separate household and the farm she lives on, you know, takes her name, right? That gets named for her. I mean, it's part of that world that gets displaced, but doesn't disappear with the arrival of Christianity, right? Where you can have these two households. Uh, so it's, I found that story really strange and interesting. And, and like I said earlier, you know, the way in which the lineage that follows, you know, Kirtan and so on, like the, the Irish part never quite disappears. Like, cause he's named after his Irish grandfather, Kirtan. Yeah. Uh, Kirtan's great grandfather. Great, right. Great grandfather. Yeah. So like, there's a sense in which there's a kind of persistence of that. And then Kirtan becomes the turning point in the Christianization of Iceland, right? Because he converts in Norway in a way that kind of like takes the whole gang together. Right. Right. Um, so, so it's, it, there's a, there's a, there's a complicated, like, like Ireland functions this really complicated and weird way in that story. And I just would love to understand it better. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely leading to part of why Olaf and Kjartan are such remarkable people because, you know, they have royal blood in them, so to speak. In addition to the important Norse Icelandic people, there's also important Irish people. But it is, it is unsettled. Like it's not, it, it hasn't been smoothed down into a pure fable at that point. It's, it's left a lot of those sore spots in that you brought up. Well, I wondered if part of it was like there's this consciousness of Ireland as a place that's been Christian for a long, long, long time. And so that's part of like what's subterraneanly kind of moving the action here somehow. Yeah, maybe. It's also it's also an area where Vikings were starting to make inroads. Oh, for sure. But I don't know if they would have at that point. I don't know. But the other thing that this makes me think of is this question of our relationship with the characters. Hmm. Is Hoskold someone you like? Hmm. Who do you like in this book? Like, are you supposed to feel this way towards them? Where you think, oh yeah, Kjartan is such a fantastic character. I wish I had a Kjartan in my life. Or Guthrun is amazing. Or, <laughs> or you know, I, I remember thinking most of the time, Hoskold is just awful. <laughs> and like, what sorts of relationships are you supposed to have with the characters? Did you, did, did you walk away particularly, you know, a fan of any of the characters? Like, well, I did not like Guthrun. I thought she was just a bitch. I mean, <laughs> so I did not like her at all. Um, and I, I guess the characters I was most interested by were the ones who were trying to make it all work, like Olaf, for example, like trying to, like you said earlier, trying to figure out how you stop the cycles of violence. How do you try to get a handle on what's going on? You know, especially when the, like, Snorri does that too, but it's in a more detached way, right? For Olaf, it's very personal. It's like it's his own family, right? So how do you mediate all these conflicting loyalties and obligations in in a way that will like keep the social fabric whole. I found that really interesting. So I don't know if it's the same thing as liking a character, but I found myself really sympathetic to, with that impulse. Like, how do you how do you do that? I absolutely agree. And that aspect of this story and several of the characters within it reminded me a lot of parts of Monkey Beach. Oh, interesting. Where you've also got a small community. Mm -hmm. small, tight, close-knit community with long history and a long connection to the land. I mean, mm -hmm. names, you know, in Monkey Beach, where things got their name also is a big thing. And you've also got uh, people who are trying to deal with bad actors mm -hmm. and trying mm -hmm. to make things go smoothly forward and productively forward. And how without, do you manage that? Yeah. Yeah. Without, without, while recognizing wrongs that have been done, but also like not wanting them to escalate mm -hmm. and not wanting, I mean, on Iceland, they're much more willing to just send people away to get put people in exile. That happens to a few characters, but it is kind of a last resort thing. Yeah, I was just going to say that's kind of the difference, right? Like, there's in Monkey Beach, there was this really strong sense that you know we don't throw people away, right? You 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 try to find a way to integrate them if, if you can, as you know, up to a limit. You know, when there's too much harm being done you know, then it's not possible anymore. But here, I can think of because of the way the sea is functioning, right? There's always that, you know, okay, get out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think they do try very hard not to just exile people. Mm. You know, terrible people stick around for a long time, getting pushed further and further outside of the local societies before they're finally exiled and outlawed. And, you know, when outlaws show up, even outlaws who come back, who sneak back in, uh, like there's one character who's outlawed who comes back in and it's like, and Guthrun well, hides him. <laughs> Guthrun hides him because of course she does. It's going to be useful. Of course she does. <laughs> and, of course she does. But there's a sense of like, is there a way of reintegrating him into society or not, or does he just have to leave again? And you know, there's this is a question. This is an active question for the community and for the leaders within the community, both the official ones and people like Guthrun, those sort of less official movers and shakers. Yeah. And I find that fascinating as well. Yeah. No, it's a very strange world. And like I said, once I got accustomed to the extent 
to which you have to sort of let the complexities, the genealogy and the families kind of wash over you. Once I surrendered to that, I actually really enjoyed it. Good, 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 good. Now you've been to Iceland, haven't you? I never have because we were talking about the landscape, but I have a hard time imagining it. It's supposed to be very unusual and very weird, though, isn't it? It is. I have been to Iceland once a few years ago for an academic conference. It was, I mean, the academic conference was fine, but going to (laughs) Iceland was amazing. It was absolutely gorgeous. I totally recommend when you, if you ever have a chance Uh to go to Iceland. Um, And yeah, we did. I, I didn't get to see tremendous amounts of the island. I didn't go anywhere near where this takes place, but the parts of Iceland that I did see were just stunning. Some of the most I mean, Thingvetler, where the all thing would happen once a year, where all the different people would get together. I I was all excited going to it because like history and all thing. And I've read the sagas. I know this is great. But actually, it's like a place where the continents are separating. And so there's these giant crevasses that you can walk through of just big stone. And it's, you know, they've used it in like, I think, Game of Thrones. Like, it's very Mm -hmm. dramatic scenery. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it it was breathtaking. It was like nothing else I'd seen before. Yeah, it was all volcanic, right? It's all very volcanic. It's all very new. There's all sorts of weird stuff behind it. Um, mm. Yeah, it's 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 very strange. And we got to see some of the volcanoes on on our little tour that we got to take. Wow. And yeah, and and this was just a few years after that big Eyjafjallajökull that went off about ten years ago. Yeah, nobody could go anywhere for a while. <laughs> exactly. So we got to see that way off in the distance at one point because it was a remarkably clear day. Also, we were there in the middle of summer, mm. which meant that uh, daytime. So, so yeah, much it did daytime. not so much get dark as it got purple. Oh wow! And it really would throw you when you're just like, ah, oh, man, it must be like. You know, eight or nine o'clock, I should start thinking about getting dinner. Let me check my watch. It's 11.30. Oh, wow. That's so weird. It just threw everything off. It was great. Well, one of the things I noticed in the saga is that, like, whenever, wherever you are in the winter, you stay there. Yeah. <laughs> you oh, yeah, yeah, that? yeah. Like, you know, there's this real sense that, uh, okay, well, next year I'll be going back to, you know, like, th- th- there's no question of traveling in those months. And I mean, that sort of thing happens in Jane Austen novels as well, but like... It really happens here. Yeah, you're just not going to travel in the winter. Um, yeah, no, these are great. I really enjoyed my time in Iceland. I really love the sagas. It's all great. Ah, well, excellent. I'm glad you got to try it. I'm glad I got to revisit this text. Uh, We're going to try something a little bit new now, which is we're just going to talk about another book that we've been reading lately. Have you been reading anything interesting lately? Well, I have, and it's a little it's a little unusual in the sense that I, I it's different from anything I've read before. It's a book called "And Grandma Said: Iroquois Teachings as Passed Down Through the Oral Tradition," and a friend of mine recommended it to me, and because I was really interested in and was talking with him about oral knowledge in indigenous cultures and what it means for that to come into the sphere of writing and how we might value oral knowledge, right? So that might be poetics, it might be history, it might be scientific or philosophical knowledge. Like, How do we value that the way that we value things that are in written form? And that sounds like a really dry topic, but this book is a kind of, someone's transcribed these oral teachings and then kind of, you know, gone over them with the um, person who was speaking, and who's named um, Tom Porter. And it, it's a little bit, in some ways, like in terms of its method, a little bit like a book we read together, um, Memory Serves mm. um, by Lee Maracle. But it, I mean, it's very different in a lot of ways too. Um, but that idea of like mediating between the oral and written worlds, it's very much doing that kind of thing. And it's part, I've only read about a third of it so far, but parts of it are really beautiful. I'll have to share it with you later. That sounds really neat. Um, I read at the request of friend of the show, Simone de Rochefort, who's done a special episode with us before. I read Susan Orlean's The Library Book a little while ago. Have you read this one? Do you know it? No, but I think she mentioned it when we were talking with her ages ago. It sounded really interesting. I think it's one of her favorite books. It is a really interesting book. It is about the Los Angeles Library, the main library, which burned down in the 80s very dramatically and took out a lot of a lot of books. No lives were lost because of it, but it was a tremendous amount of damage and it took a long time for it to rebuild. And somebody was accused of the arson, but never fully charged with it. And it just unpacks it in many different angles, both like in terms of this very specific fire incident, mm-hmm. but also what are libraries? What's her relationship with the library? What are other people's relationships with the library? The many interesting characters over the last hundred or so years that the Los Angeles library has been in existence, some of whom are just absolutely wild. 
the sense of like the architect, which is, you know, it's a really architecturally strange building. Uh, I've, I, I, been there many years ago before I read this book, of course, and and it is a really remarkable building. Um, and also just like, what is arson? How does arson work? Talk to arson. Oh, wow. How has the field of arson changed over the years? How it like explores this. Every chapter kind of takes a different angle. In addition, the person who is the prime suspect for the arson is one of those just weird people who, you know, he was kind of an actor, kind of an outcast in his family, lived on the edges was very strange, was, was a complete bullshit artist, would constantly be lying to people. Like, he is a remarkable figure. Uh, and he passed away uh, in the early 90s from AIDS. And it's just it's just coming at it from so many different angles. And, it, oh, wow. and a lot of it is really well written. It's a really interesting investigation. The chapter where she describes the fire itself mm -hmm. is amazingly well written and oh, wow. very evocative. And yeah, I, I really was glad I, I finally put some time down to uh, to read that. Oh, awesome. I have to have to look at that. Yeah. Uh, listeners, if you have any books that you've read recently, send them in our way. If we get a bunch, maybe we'll each pick one that sounds interesting and talk about it on the show for a hot second. Could be fun. Could be a fun yeah. new thing. I don't know. We'll give it a try. It's the beginning of the year. We should be trying different kinds of things. Yeah, let's shake it up. Let's 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 talk about other things as well. Just Real brief at the end here, just for those of you who are special enough to stick around. <laughs> Next time, what are we reading? We're reading Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass. Ah. Uh, have you had a chance to take a look at that yet? I, I mean, I've taken a look at it in as much as it's on my shelf, but I haven't started reading it yet, no. I'll be really interested to hear what you think of it, because I read it a couple of times now, and it uh, a really interesting experience with reading it. Like, It's one of those books that I ended up reading very, very, very slowly, because I was getting something out of it that I wanted to really stretch out. So that'll be fun to talk about. Yeah, I'm super curious to give it a try. I don't know if I'll respond to it as well as you did, but even if I don't, I'd love to hear more about your reactions to it next time around. I do think you, you'll find some of the writing really beautiful. No, whether the content speaks to you or not, I don't know, but the, the writing is quite beautiful in places. I'm sure I will. <laughs> All right. Well, if you'd like to get in touch with us, if you'd like to tell us what you're reading lately, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We'd always love to hear from you. Show notes with links for things we've mentioned in this episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 42. And the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at the Spouter Inn.